Hello, my name is Dr. Stanley Barr, and I'm here to tell you about some pathfinding work that I have been a part of. While this is a story about MITRE work, my part started a long time ago. In the early 1990s, I was a student at the University of Lowell in Massachusetts. I worked in a lab called the Center for Productivity Enhancement, and I worked for a seasoned professor named Dr. Patrick Krolak. But to every student in the lab, it was just Uncle Pat. Uncle Pat was truly a visionary, and I could go on for hours about Uncle Pat. But let me just say that there was one team project that I worked on for him that set the course of my career, and I dare say, the course of my life. In that research, we used expert systems, an early form of artificial intelligence to protect computers from faults and intruders. During the course of that work, I learned how vulnerable computers could be. I learned just how easy it was for intruders to access a computer and how they could do serious damage to our university and to our world without anyone knowing until it was far too late. 30 years later, I work at MITRE, a job I got through working for Uncle Pat. And I have teamed with some of the smartest, most dedicated engineers and scientists you will meet anywhere. Know that while I'm presenting this work, there are many people collaborating together back at MITRE to make this type of research happen. I'm just the lucky one who gets to talk about it on stage. I've been fascinated to see how both cyber attacks and cyber security has evolved. And I have observed some things along the way that I want to share. I've observed how cheap it is for nation states to mount cyber campaigns where the tools can be used again and again, oftentimes even against the same company. I've observed how cyber operations can be covert and how hard it can be to detect attacks. And even after discovery, how hard it can be to attribute them back to an actor. I've observed that nation state actors feel cyber is a safe place, a place that emboldens these actors to mount sophisticated and crippling attacks against their adversaries with little fear of being held responsible. So sit back and let me tell you some stories. As with all good stories, this one starts with an ancient proverb, and it rings as true today as it did when it was first uttered. 2,500 years ago, the Chinese military strategist Sun Tzu was quoted as saying, if you know the enemy and you know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. Now, I realize most of you probably don't move through your days thinking about battles and defeating enemies, but think about what that means just for one minute. If you know your enemy and you know yourself, you need not Fear. The questions are, what do these battles look like, and how do we come to know elusive cyber adversaries? Let's fast forward to the early 2000s, and I've taken just a couple news clippings from the headlines, and it seems like there's an endless list. These highlight events from those time periods. I start here as this is broadly accepted as the awakening of the whole world to the threats posed by cyber actors. In 2005, it's revealed that Chinese actors repeatedly hacked numerous U.S. networks in an operation called Titan Ring. In 2006, it's revealed that suspected Chinese attackers breached the U.S. Navy War College. In 2008, it's revealed that foreign attackers attacked the United States Department of Defense. It's claimed that this attack right here led to a whole new approach being taken by the Department of Defense. In 2008, it's revealed that foreign attackers collected emails from both the two major campaigns. Officials believe it was to understand their evolving policy positions. And in 2009, it's revealed that actors got access to the program building the United States' most sophisticated plane. This is where we found ourselves when we got some funding and were asked to look at things differently. The headlines are one thing. But well, let me tell you about how this looked from the inside of a high-tech company, one that works for the United States government. We spent lots of time on things learned by others with varying relevance to us. And it was difficult for us to find badness on our network. And yet we knew the 
absence of evidence wasn't the evidence of absence. With so little information on what bad guys did post-break-in, there wasn't always a clear picture on how to prepare for a possible event. So we put a lot of effort and a lot of thinking into changing the game. We wanted to stop being concerned that we would wind up being one of these headlines. We wanted the ability to use anything we learned from bad guys as a thread to pull on and learn more about them. We wanted the ability to impact and impose cost on their operations in some way, in any way. Before I tell you what we learned, news from the last year tells me things haven't gotten any better, and this knowledge now is applicable to everyone. In 2019, it's revealed that the United States Navy and the partners are under constant cyber siege from hackers. In the spring of 2020, it's revealed that multiple Iranian actors were working together to attack the US and Israel. And in just in September, we learned that cybercrime actors hit a U.S. healthcare giant with ransomware. Our national security, and now our medical data, our very lives are at stake. Now we find ourselves here. For all of you who don't know the story of this iconic meme, it comes from a movie called The Matrix. In one scene, there comes a moment when the hero is offered a choice. Take the blue pill and remain in blissful ignorance or take the red pill and have the truth revealed. For us, the blue pill is for us to just go about our business and not worry about cyber. Let this talk wash by. Leave here, go home, and click on everything in every email, no matter how sketchy. Since we're all at a TED event, I'll assume that we are comfortable with learning the truth. So let's pre pretend like we have taken the red pill. And now, just like in the movie, we go down the rabbit hole and come to terms with our new reality. At first glance, it might seem like I'm suggesting in this new reality that we are left up the creek with no paddle. But bear with me for a moment while I introduce Stan's damn metaphor. In this metaphor, the bad actors and their tools are like drops of water. The dam is our cyber defenses that we all rely on. And our private and sensitive data is like the unseen village lying downstream. The first truth in the new reality we must accept is there is an endless torrent of badness coming our way. Luckily, our defenses will stop most things. The second truth in the new reality we must accept is, like with heavy rains, in our case, massive cyber attacks, some badness will always find its way through. Luckily for us, the bad guys like water will often try the easiest path first. And I'll give you some examples in a moment. And like with the overflowing dam, controlled spill is the best way to release a surge of water. We just have to give the water a course, a course that steers its path away from our village. Now this might seem a little esoteric right now, so let me tell you about how this very approach was used successfully and recently by a real target in a real high stakes contest. Our story starts in 2016 when the Hillary Clinton campaign suffered a massive data breach. I honestly believe it caused her campaign a good amount of tumult. In France, the presidential candidate Emmanuel Macron saw what was happening and election day was fast approaching. He feared he would be targeted in the same way. And his campaign accepted they could not stop some amount of successful hacking. And in fact, they were hacked. Attackers stole the equivalent of about 900,000 pages of printed emails. Almost literally at the 11th hour, the attackers dumped their damaging trove of data. Luckily, Macron and his campaign had some, taken some proactive steps. They created fake email accounts and filled them with realistic and far-fetched content. They created fake emails among real campaign workers. Some of this data was so absurdly hyperbolic, not even I will repeat the content. They spammed their own users with emails, some 
claiming to provide usernames and passwords to both fake and real accounts. I'm assuming there was some legitimate sounding rules like, hey, can you log in, check for anything important? My phone is broken, here's my username and password. Now, usually username and passwords are the holy grail for getting someone's email. So the attackers use this as their path of least resistance. This channeled the adversaries towards the places the defenders wanted them to go. When the credentials were used and the accounts were accessed, the defenders were able to see exactly what was going on, when it was happening, and how it was being done. When the email dumps dropped, journalists and citizens alike started pawing through. Many instantly recognized the fakes. And of course, the campaign was quick to point out the most absurd ones. Even though only an estimated 20% of the data was fake, it immediately cast out on all the remaining stuff that was stolen. These simple steps helped mitigate the attacker's goals of dumping damaging materials and influencing the French election. In that story, you're probably wondering, cool, Stan, but how did they steal the first email? Honestly, I don't know. In my experience, there are two very effective approaches. First, oftentimes users have weak email account passwords and cannot caution you against this enough. Second, bad guys frequently use something called a spearfish. This is basically an email with a malicious link or attachment. Users click the thing, something bad happens, and the bad guys are off to the races. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do at MITRE when we find something interesting. Suppose we find a suspicious email or file. We put it on a special machine. Then we double click on whatever it is. The thing does its thing, then we watch, and we wait, and we hope the fun begins. When it works, it closes gaps in our intelligence. We have learned about adversary tools and tactics and procedures. Sometimes we learn what they're after and what better needs to be protected. However, it's not without risks. Let me tell you the story about MITRE's great thumb drive debacle. We found this cool thing. And in a moment of haste, the newest member of the team was told to set everything up. He was told, put the malware on the USB. Put the USB in the computer. Copy the malware to the desktop and double click the malware. What happened next is a story that will never grow old. The adversary was waiting. They instantly started doing stuff and we were watching. The bad guys took their time and they did some stuff to see where they were and what this computer was all about. Then they listed the contents of the user's folder and boy, had we made sure there was some good stuff there. We were so hoping that they would start taking stuff and exfiltrating it. And then, then they decided to see if there were any USB drives plugged in and time stopped for us. They had found ours. We had forgotten to take it out. They listed the files, and there it was, plain as day, malware.exe. What happened next was crazy. They spent the next 30 minutes manually typing frantically and doing all sorts of crazy things to try and mask their tracks. Finally, they did something to make sure the computer would not boot again and vanished. After we were finished being stunned, we had never seen a, a bad guy so angry over being caught. We popped out the drive and threw it in the bin to be reformatted. We popped in a brand new one, full of good stuff, fresh stuff, reset our trap, and we were up in a matter of minutes. We made him waste a lot of time on our fake machine. He wasn't attacking real victims. Instead of just bugging out and calling it a day, he wasted all time creating a spectacle. We made some notes, we archived our findings, and moved on. We had, in fact, imposed costs. Over the years, we have had a lot of these engagements. We've captured hundreds of tools and hundreds of other indicators of compromise. We've run long-term operations. We know by who and how and when certain things are done. We can extrapolate forwards and backwards about attacks. 
we have confidence now. Not a confidence that says we'll never be hacked, but a confidence that says we are now better prepared. And we assert, maybe, just maybe, the data you steal from us might not be worth using. We've shared a lot of data, both publicly and privately, to protect ourselves, our partners, and the cyber community at large. In summary, if you take one thing away from this talk, let it be, we can all, every one of us, better prepare. We can make sure there is deceptive information just lying around. So someone gets your data, they get fake stuff too. In addition, this area needs a lot more work. We need cyber people to make scalable traps, social scientists who know how to fool the human brain, policy experts to explain why this is proper and needed. We need companies to mix it up with bad guys. When they're operating in deceptive environments, they aren't stealing real data. We need people to share what they learn. In fact, share with me, I promise. I will open anything you send me. Finally, let's make my Uncle Pat proud and make the bad guys question everything they take. Thank you very much for listening.